You are clear for launch. And with that, shut down your visors. O2 on and prepare for ignition to O2. EPP, copy that. And, um... Hey, Mr. Rushoff here. So let's talk sources. This is what separates research papers from nearly all other types of writing. And what are sources? Well, sources are the publications or the material from which writers get their information. And there's many things that can be a source. Books, magazines, videos, newspapers, data, art pieces, websites, conversations, speeches, government data, letters, poems, advertisements, diaries, journals, you name it. If it has information about your topic, it can be a source, but not all sources are created the same. So let's look at the sources in two major ways. First of all, is to see how close the sources are to the origin of the information or the event. And then we're gonna look at scholarly sources and popular sources. Let's talk about those scholarly versus popular sources first. The biggest difference between these primarily lies with the differences in the authorship, the purpose, and its intended audience. Scholarly sources are written for a smaller, specialized audience who are interested in the dense original research that these publications are meant to convey. The authors of these sources are considered experts or scholars in the field, and usually these publications have gone through an evaluation process of other experts in the field, which is called a peer review. Now, scholar resources are usually always acceptable in any research paper you're going to write. Now, next to scholarly sources is something called gray literature. We call it gray literature because it's in that kind of gray area in between scholarly research and popular sources. Gray literature includes reports from government and non-profit organizations, and often they're very high quality, just like that of a scholarly source. However, they have not had the peer review process that you'll find in scholarly sources and you need to check for bias as we do for all sources. Examples of gray literature are reports from the United Nations, the World Bank, the OECD, Congressional Research Office, among others. Generally, gray uh, literature sources are acceptable in most research that you're gonna do. However, most publications you have read are popular sources, and that's not by mistake. They are meant to have a popular appeal, and examples of popular sources are things such as magazines, newspapers, and websites. These sources are meant to entertain and give general information about a topic, and many times they do both at the same time. They are written by authors who cover a large number of topics, and although they may be knowledgeable by a topic, they're rarely an expert on that topic. Now, there are a few easy ways to tell whether your source is a scholarly source or a popular source. If the publication has advertisements for popular goods, it's probably a popular source. As, second, as scholarly sources usually don't have any advertising. If they do, usually it's for university press books or conferences. If the publication has citations showing where the writer has retrieved their own information, it's likely is a scholarly source because most popular sources rarely will have footnotes or references showing their sources. And maybe the easiest way to determine the difference between the two is that if the publication might seem fun to read because it's written in a light, witty style, has colorful and artistic photographs, it is most assuredly a popular source because scholarly sources tend to be very, very sober in comparison, written with subject-specific speech and language, and it usually doesn't have a lot of graphics despite maybe some charts and tables and an occasional photograph. Now, if you're in college or you're a high school upperclassman, you probably want to stay away from the popular sources. Now, if you do use popular sources, I'd recommend those which are, are essentially special interest publications. These include uh, magazines such as Scientific American, National Geographic, the National Mis uh, History Museum, the Smithsonian Magazine. These type of popular sources are often used experts to, in their fields to write their articles. Now, these are usually going to be fine for high school underclassmen and middle schoolers, and will probably be fine for high school upperclassmen as long as there's some other better sources used in it as well. Then there are the general news sources, such as newspapers and magazines. These are all part of your popular sources. If you're writing on current events, this might be the best sources you have available. 
But if you're looking for a source to describe a subject, then you need to realize that the authors for these publications are not experts. Rather, they're just the people who have interviewed the experts. So while these sources might be okay for students who are just learning how to write research papers and cite sources, I recommend you go for the sources that are actually written by the experts. All right, so we have scholarly versus popular sources, but sources may also be described by how close the source is to the origin of the information or the event. We break these into three categories known as primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. Primary sources are the closest to the topic at hand. These are the first-hand accounts of the raw information of an event or an idea. These are, include eyewitness interviews, journals from the time, statistics and data, photographs, as well as scholarly research papers discussing original research conducted and the collected data. Interestingly, photos, art, diaries are primary sources, but they're neither popular or scholarly sources. But that's fine because usually relevant primary resources are always going to be fair game in a research paper. Now, secondary sources are essentially at least one step away from the first-hand account of the information. Essentially, secondary sources are using other primary sources and even other secondary sources to make their point. So, examples of primary sources might be a picture during the Battle of Gettysburg or maybe a soldier's handwritten list of casualties. A secondary source would be an article that takes the accounts of multiple participants, including this picture and the diary, as well as the diaries of soldiers and generals on both sides, as well as maps of the battle and other photographs to describe the battle and its implications. Essentially, secondary sources interpret and analyze primary sources. While college classes prefer primary sources over secondary sources, secondary sources can usually be used. Additionally, they're usually fine for high school papers. Now, the difference between primary and secondary sources seems straightforward, right? Well, not all the time. Sometimes a secondary source can actually become a primary source. And this often happens with newspapers and magazines in the field of history or political science. Let me explain. Let's say you're writing a paper on healthcare in the United States and the Los Angeles Times story in the passage of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare would be a secondary source if you're using it to describe the con contents of the bill. However, if you were using this article to be able to look at the media and the public reaction to the bill at the time, then this same article would be considered a primary source because it's essentially an eyewitness account of what were people thinking when Obamacare was passed. And then there are tertiary sources. And usually, especially at the college level, you're not gonna use tertiary sources. And even at the high school level, you should try to stay away from using tertiary sources. Tertiary sources refer to those sources that synthesize, summarize, and index the information of other sources. Essentially, you're taking a lot of secondary sources and you're putting it together. Great for general information, but it's just not a really good use of a source for a research paper. Now, examples of these are, uh, of tertiary sources are encyclopedias, textbooks, Olimax, and even Wikipedia. Speaking of Wikipedia, this is a part of sources that you should never use. And by use, I mean you're actually in the, having that information from these sources end up in your paper. Now, in addition to Wikipedia, I would avoid using Quora.com, personal websites, blogs, and most social media. And it's not that the information on Wikipedia and the other websites are bad. In many cases, it's not. In 2005, an article in the journal Nature found that Wikipedia is about as accurate as the Encyclopedia Britannica, another tertiary source that you probably shouldn't use. Now, you have even probably heard me recommend that the starting place for a research paper can easily be Wikipedia. But you don't want to end with Wikipedia by citing information from it in your papers. Regardless of what type of source you use, you need to evaluate your sources for credibility and reliability. Evaluating our sources is very important, especially in our internet age. For an example, take the Northwest Tree Octopus. If you go to this website address, you will come to a colorful website that's dense with information about the creature. There's maps, there's videos, there's photographs, there's testimonies, and a wonderful description of the, uh, of the tree octopus and the challenge it has 
as an endangered species. The only problem is this website is a hoax. It's totally a hoax. There is no such creature. Yet a 2007 study of 13 year olds found that half believed the website to be true. 10 years later, a study of Dutch children between 11 and 12 years old reported that only 7% of the children actually called the website unreliable. These are middle schoolers. Therefore, we, for every source that we you use, there are five questions to ask. The first thing you want to ask is whether the source is truly related to your topic. It is easy as you're doing your research to get sucked in into an interesting article, only to realize later that it doesn't really address any of your research questions. Next, you want to look at the author. Does the author have any qualifications to write on your subject? Should they actually know what they're talking about? This is one of the advantages of using scholarly sources. By definition, a scholarly source is a scholar or an expert in the field, and their information has already been reviewed by other experts. Another way to determine the authority of an author is to see if their qualifications can be found on an article or their background can be found on the publication's website. If not, you might have to Google their name to find out who they are. Now, the third question to ask is, how recent was the source published? As more and more research is done over time in nearly every field, what might be true five years ago may have been found to be incorrect through additional study. Therefore, you always want to be looking for the latest information. And what is too old is largely based upon what topic you're writing about. For example, history papers may actually require you to intentionally locate older sources that might describe the time that you're researching. While sources and other subjects, such as literature, social studies, and the arts, should be within 10 years, although I like actually keeping within five years myself. If your subject is science or technically related, then you're going to want to look for sources within three years or even more recent to capture the very latest research on that topic. And then you want to look at what is the purpose of the source. Does the author seem to be advocating for a specific course of action? Are they biased? Are they impartial? Are they using data that is credible to make their claim? Now, many times you will find experts on either side of an issue who advocate for a particular stance. Take for an example, if you're writing a paper on gun control, you're going to find authors who are experts on either side of the issue. But just because they might be a, cha uh, a champion of gun control legislation or be an advocate for gun rights, doesn't necessarily mean you should automatically dismiss their source. It does mean that you need to make sure you are aware of their point of view and make sure to account for this bias in your own writing. For example, you might want to use sources from both sides to compare and contrast each side's positions, but you should also use unbiased data to help you be able to evaluate their respective arguments. And last, you should look at whether the information is likely to be true. Once again, this is an advantage of using scholarly sources which have been peer-reviewed. In order to be published, they've had to be reviewed by experts in the field. Other sources can be harder to determine, especially online sources. Here's a few tips about websites. You want to avoid uh, sources that have multiple spelling and grammar mistakes. Reliable site sites will nearly always have editors that will fix all these. I would also avoid websites that seem to be outdated or they have multiple links that no longer work. Sites with multiple advertisers or clickbait should be avoided. And in order to determine websites that are more likely to be reliable, you might also take a look at the three letters after the dot in the website address. If they are .gov or .edu, these are US government or educational institutions and more likely to be reliable. A .org website is usually used by advocacy organizations or nonprofits that might be trying to influence a public opinion. However, there are many great literature articles that come from these same websites. For example, the United Nations is a .org website. A .com website is usually going to be a commercial organization or a business, so they're probably going to be trying to sell you something. The letters after the dot may also indicate a foreign website. For example, .uk is a website from the United Kingdom, while .kp is that from North Korea. One might be more reliable than the other. Now, if the author's full name and their qualifications are on the website, 
your website is probably more likely to be credible, but that's not always the case. And if the website has listed the sources and its information, it might be more credible than those that do not. Okay, so we've looked at scholarly and popular sources. We've looked at the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. We even threw great literature at you. Additionally, we looked at the five questions you need to ask in order to determine the credibility of our sources. Now, you can begin to search for those sources that are going to best assist you in your research paper. Thanks for watching, and as always, keep on learning.